Hi there, I'm Jan Vikoski, I'm Director of the Banbury Centre here at Cold Spring Harbour Laboratory and this is the fourth day of the 80th Cold Spring Harbour Symposium on Quantitative Biology. Uh, the topic today, uh, or rather the topic of the meeting, is uh, 21st century uh, genetics, genes at work, and uh, Jennifer Doudner from Un University of California, Berkeley, is an expert, uh, certainly on the latter aspect of, of, of our title. So Jennifer, people, people will, will know of you, or will get to know of you in a way primarily through the use of the CRISPR-Cas9 system in genetic engineering. But l l can we go back a little bit first and about the biology of the system and how you got involved in, in working on it? Well, we actually started working on CRISPR biology about 10 years ago. I, I got interested in this because of a colleague of mine at Berkeley, Jillian Banfield, who was doing research on bacterial communities and the viruses that infect them. And she had noticed a lot of interesting repetitive sequences in their genomic sequencing data. And she wondered if the sequences uh, that she noticed were actually being employed in the form of RNA molecules to protect the cells uh, from viral infection. So we started investigating this, and um, this led eventually to our uh, work with Emmanuel Charpentier to understand mm -hmm. the function of a particular protein called Cas9 that turns out to be an RNA-guided DNA cutting enzyme. So for viruses, this or for uh, for bacteria, this is a great way to fight viruses because they use RNA molecules that target the viral sequences and Cas9 is then directed to cut uh, viral right. DNA. And is this, is this a, I guess it's a, an, an, it's not, is it an innate, would you call it an innate immunity system? I would, yeah, well I guess I'd call it an adaptive immunity yes, system. Yes, that's better. So it's it? uh, basically a way that bacteria can acquire genetic material from viruses, insert it into these CRISPR sequences right. in the genome, and then transcribe it into RNA, and then those RNA molecules are able to base pair with viral DNAs that have matching right, sequences. Right. And is this, is this common to lots of bacteria? I mean, is this a it common is. feature of all bacteria? Not all. Uh, I would say about half of the sequenced bacterial genomes have one or more CRISPR locuses mm. in the loci in the genome, yeah. It sounds though it's an important biological system for a bacterial cell to have. Why is it not more widely spread? You well, you know, bacteria have a lot of ways that they avoid viruses. So I think what we're seeing is that CRISPR systems are operating in, in certain kinds of bacteria, and perhaps in certain kinds of environments where they're particularly advantageous. But there's a lot of bacteria that simply maybe don't need them because mm. they have other ways of fighting off know. the viruses that they encounter. Right. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the virus infects a cell, enzyme which enzyme chops the vote? The well, there are, there are a few different ones depending on the type of, of CRISPR system, but the one that's caught a lot of people's attention for genome engineering is an enzyme called Cas9. And, and why, why is that particularly useful? In, why is it caught attention of genetic engineers? Well, it's a great enzyme. You know, it's a, it's a fascinating, it's a little machine. It basically, uh, it's programmable. Mm -hmm. So it can be programmed with a short uh, sequence of RNA and that provides the base pairing information to recognize DNA molecules that have a matching or complementary sequence. And that enables the Cas9 protein to make a double-stranded break, break in the DNA. And, and from an engineering point of view, why, is it, why, why does it improve over other systems like, do I think, Talens or other, other ways of cutting, making directed cuts in DNA? Well, um, I should say that you know what's been really interesting over the last few decades really is that you know scientists have appreciated that introducing double-stranded breaks into the genome of a cell um, can be a very useful way of changing the genetic uh, sequence in mm -hmm. those cells and so uh, in, in a precise uh, fashion so the challenge has been technically how did how do you do that and so there have been a number of technologies that have, that have come along over the years. I can remember all the way back to the 80s when I was a graduate student, you know, various chemical methods. Uh, Peter Durbin's lab, for example, had come up with ways of cleverly, uh, you know, targeting particular sequences. And then, as you mentioned, there also are various types of protein-based approaches where you can um, create proteins that have a very particular DNA recognition property, enabling them to 
bind to a particular site in the genome mm -hmm. and introduce a break. The challenge with, with really all of those technologies has been that it's been really hard to um, make them uh, widely uh, applicable. And so with the, in the case of proteins that recognize DNA, they, it, it's an engineering problem. You have to engineer a new protein for each Big experiment. Mm -hmm. right? And the nifty thing about Cas9 is that the RNA does the programming. So it's uh, fairly trivial mm -hmm. to make a, a new strand of RNA that provides the targeting information. The protein stays the same in every experiment. And you change the specificity just by uh, switching out the RNA. Yeah. I mean, am I right? I think it reminds me a bit of telomerase in the way that the, the, the telomeres get get kept getting elongated, or don't, rather don't shorten with each division. Well, yeah, I would say that there's an interesting parallel there. You know, telomerase also uses an, uh, a guide uh, RNA to template the, mm. the extension of sequences at the end of the telomere. So this is a uh, sort of a, uh, this is not a polymerase, right? This is a, sure. a protein that, that, that simply binds to DNA and then cuts it. But nonetheless, it's also using um, RNA-DNA mm. base pairing to do to, that. To guide, get guided to the right yeah. place. But, but slightly off, not slightly off, but the, it is fascinating how how, uh, what an important role RNA has played. Uh, no arguments maybe from there. <laughs> yeah, yes, uh, I don't know. So when, when, when were the first small RNAs found? In the mid uh, uh, 90s? Well, let's see. Yeah, in the 90s. That's right. So 20, yeah. 25 years ago, yeah. Um, yeah. RNA was, was really just an in, interim. Well, I remember dream. Gary Rufkin, you know, yeah. at Harvard, um, where I was a graduate student, so I knew him from, you know, way back, uh, uh, telling me, it, yeah, it was sometime in the early 90s that they had found a gene called uh, LET7 in, in C. elegans, you know, these nematode worms that encodes a small RNA, and they had no idea uh, what it was, uh, what its function was, but they knew genetically that it was very important for the development of the worm. So that was the first time I heard about a small RNA being functional, yeah. and you know, of course, we know where that went. Yes, so. right, right. Um, so moving now to the sort of the engineering aspect of it, what what are the sort of steps that, that you do? You you have to syn you have to synthesize the guide RNA, and then uh, I'm trying to imagine uh, does the does the enzyme just pick this up, or do you have to wed the two together, or well, here's the beautiful thing about the system, I would say, is that it, it has a natural uh, ability to, to, uh, for the protein and the RNA to come together. So it turns out that, and this is the work that I did with Emmanuel Charpentier's lab, is that we figured out that, you know, that in nature, Cas9 actually binds to two separate RNA molecules. One of them provides the DNA targeting information, mm -hmm. and the other provides the structural um, interaction with the guiding RNA to allow binding to Cas9, the protein. And so we figured that out, and then we understood that we could actually re-engineer those two RNAs into a single guide RNA mm -hmm. that provides both mm -hmm. of those functions in the same molecule. So it just makes it a much simpler sure. system for uh, genome editing. And so the way that one actually applies this then as a technology is to express uh, the Cas9 protein. Uh, that can be done, be done either uh, by introducing it into cells uh, in encoded in a DNA molecule, like a plasmid mm -hmm. uh, DNA, or it can be introduced in the form of an RNA that encodes the protein, or it can actually just be introduced as the protein itself, uh, it turns out. And the guide RNA also needs to go in in one of those same ways. Um, and uh, once the, the uh, protein and the RNA are together in the cell, and of course the protein has a nuclear localization signal engineered into it, so it goes into mm -hmm. the nucleus, and uh, the, the affinity of binding of the protein and the RNA is very high and it's very specific. So it means that this protein will actually find its RNA out of all the RNAs yes, in the cell, yeah. Uh, will bind to its guide and then use that for uh, recognition of DNA and making the cut. It all sounds very straightforward. <laughs> is oh, it as straightforward is, as you as you as This is the amazing thing. It really is. You know, I mean, in my lab, you know, some of the early experiments that we did testing this in in mammalian cells were all done by a first year graduate student. You know, and she's a very good and very talented sure, student, sure. but she was inexperienced. And you know, it's just uh, goes to show that I think the technology is very straightforward. Actually, yeah. I can see from what you've described that it's, it's relatively easy to do in cells and culture. What are the complications when you're trying to do it in vivo? 
Well, uh, you know, of course, the issue there is delivery, yes. I would say. That's mm -hmm. probably the major issue. Uh, you know, how do you get it into particular tissues? How do you get it into uh, an organ if you wanted to do it for some kind of therapeutic application? Um, that's, that's, a, that's a challenge. That's a challenge for any, any, sure. any of these any types of the, technologies, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and, of course, the also, the, you know, another sort of hand-in-hand hand with that goes the, the whole efficacy and, and, and specificity mm -hmm. uh, issue. You know, how, how specific is it can, if we were using it as a human therapeutic? Uh, can we ensure that the, the editing that happens is accurate enough for that kind of application? So what sort of applications has it been used for? Well, this is what's so exciting. I just, you know, I, I, uh, I feel uh, so um, encouraged that I think this, this really is going to be used eventually to help patients. So far, you know, it's been, there have been a number of, to me, very exciting uh, publications that, that report using this in various kinds of animal Models. So Tyler Jax's lab mm -hmm. at, at, at MIT, for example, has done some beautiful work where they are uh, targeting uh, particular genes in mice and showing that they can have either a therapeutic benefit or they can actually uh, they can actually induce uh, types of cancers that otherwise couldn't be studied very easily. So uh, you know you can sort of use it in, in both ways mm -hmm. in animal systems. Um, Hans Cleavers, who sort of pioneered the use of organoids, uh, mm -hmm. where they can actually yep. culture cells in, uh, that, that become organ-like in, you know, in, a, in a sort of a petri dish kind mm -hmm. of thing, uh, has actually been able to use this system to show that you can correct mutations that cause cystic fibrosis. And then people have also been able to show that you can uh, use uh, blood cells, that blood, you can take cells from patients that have sickle cell anemia and other blood disorders that are genetic in, in, in origin and use the Cas9 system to induce editing of those cells that introduces a corrective mutation. Mm. So I think we can see the, the incredible potential for this. And now you know, we need to just put the steps in place to figure out the delivery and, and safety issues. So thinking about safety, and delivery and specificity. Um, what do you see? Is it fair to ask you what you see as sort of timeline for using this sort of system in in, in human beings? Well, it's um, always. Uh, uh, <laughs> or shouldn't I put you on the <laughs> so, spot? Well, you can put me on the spot. <laughs> It's always hard to know, right? Uh, but I think my best guess right now is that uh, you know there's tremendous activity in the space, so it means that the field is moving forward very, very quickly. Um, I think that uh, I would be very, um, I, I'm very, uh, I think it's very likely that we'll see clinical trials initiating within the next three years mm -hmm. in various human systems, probably initially in. Uh, tissues that are quite um, amenable to introducing this kind of technology, and I'm thinking yes. here of you know blood cells, hematopoietic, is, is yeah. hematopoietic cells, yeah. right, or, right, or the eye, you know, would be yes. another place, or the liver. Yes. Uh, yeah. I think those are those are probably the most likely initial targets. And beyond that, you know, uh, you know, if you imagine that you know initial you know clinical trials are initiated, and if they go well. Um, it's still going to be a number of years before you know we could reach a point where we could uh, expect FDA approval yeah, or something. Sure. So I think I think we're looking at ten years, you know, yeah, probably yeah. realistically. Yeah. But if you think about the fact that this is only a you know a two two plus year old technology, it's quite astounding to think that you know this is a real possibility. Does I I can remember thinking uh, you, you know, many or oh, rather. There was the enthusiasm about gene therapy, I guess, in the in the eighties. Uh, it never really came came to pass. Does and maybe even gene gene therapy got rather a, a bad name, particularly of the you know, boy, the young man who died. I, is is this system going to suffer? Do you think from that sort of taint is too strong a word? Um, you know, to some people, just the words gene therapy immediately you know, raise Frankenstein-like yeah. like images. They, they do, uh, and I agree. I, you know, because I think it, you know the the uh, sort of certainly the original gene therapy approaches were um, not using a precise way of introducing information into genomes. It was relying on uh, viral integration, mm -hmm. and of course, then the virus mm -hmm. decides where it's where it's going, not right. not the experimenter. Right. Right. So um, you know, so that that obviously proved to be problematic. And uh, here, you know, I think that uh, we, we have a, um, a tool that really is, is uh, highly specific. So it's really, I think of it like a scalpel, you know, it's really sort of a molecular scalpel mm. that allows 
very precise cutting of the DNA. Um, we do need to get a better handle on the repair process after the cut is made. So mm -hmm. uh, right now, for example, it's fairly easy to make knockouts of genes, so disrupting a sequence in a gene. It's harder to make a knock-in of new genetic information. It can be done, but uh, but cells decide how to do it, not not the experimenter. So, so I think that's one of the very active areas of research that will be uh, important for ensuring future safety of this. I think that, and this is one reason I mentioned uh, the, I think the initial interest in using hematopoietic stem cells for, for editing is that, you know, you could envision doing the editing and then being able to ver verify and validate in vitro, uh, before, in vitro before yeah. putting those cells but, back into yeah. a patient. Yeah. So I think that's very attractive. Um, but I feel confident, I guess, that, you know, that uh, with all of the, the great people and, and, and great science that's going on around this, that, you know, that the field will move in the direction of really um, getting to the point where this is, uh, we have enough understanding of how it works and how to make sure that it's accurate, that it can be employed, yeah. you know, in other systems. Yeah. Well, I think that's probably the moment to stop. Okay, very Jennifer, good. thank you very much indeed. Great talking to you. Bye.